so we're going to continue in this vein, and I guess the question is how far do we take the identification issue? Um, are we talking retina scanning, thumbprint like on the iPhone 5 and beyond? Are we talking embedded chips in our skin like some Hollywood sci-fi blockbuster? So uh, our next guest is going to tell us about biometrics, the founder of the Biometrics Institute, Ted Dunstone. Thank you. You'll be pleased to know I won't be microchipping anybody today. <laughs> Um, I'm, I'm here on behalf of the Biometrics Institute. Uh, I thought I'd start by just telling you a little bit about the Biometrics Institute. <clears throat> the Institute is a um, not-for-profit organisation. It operates in New Zealand, Australia, um, uh, the uh, EU uh, through a London base and uh, moving into the US. Um, there may even be some members in this room at the moment. Um, Kiwi Bank is a member, um, RBS, uh, Lloyds, Barclays, um, many of uh, the technology companies, of course, and many of the um, government agencies that operate in this space are also members. Uh, we've been operating for over 10 years, and the remit of the Institute is uh, to bring together people who are starting this journey associated with biometrics, with people that have been doing this work for a long time, to share lessons learned, to innovate, to understand risk profiles, and really to, to move the industry forward um, and so I'd encourage uh, anybody who is interested in biometrics or who's moving that direction to um, have a look at the Biometrics Institute website um, and uh, consider membership. I've got uh, some forms at the end, uh, a link at the end. The other things that the Institute does is they promote um, uh, responsible use through the use of privacy codes and there's a trust framework. It's very interesting to hear Mandy speak earlier about the work that uh, Real Me is doing in that area as well. Um, and uh, issues to do with vulnerability and risk assessment as well are, are really key aspects. Um, I'm, I'm going to talk primarily today about mobile phones and biometrics. And the reason for that is that biometrics have been in use, whether people realise it or not, in the government services for, for many years, for uh, at least 10 in, in many cases. So. Uh, every passport which people would have in this room would have embedded in it a biometric chip which would have a face recognition template and that's what's used with SmartGate if you're going into and out of Australia um, and now New Zealand as well. Um, so the technology behind that has been quite mature, uh, however it really has stayed quite niche in the, bio in the, um, the application inside government. Yes there have been some uh, very good uses outside government, but uh, certainly in Australia and New Zealand it's never made a, a big splash outside government and uh, certainly globally that has also not been the case. I think we are starting to see a significant shift and the reason for that shift is the adoption of biometrics as part of mobile phones. Um, can I have a show of hands here? Who's got a, bio who's got a, a mobile phone which has got biometric recognition on it? So iPhone 6, tablets, even Android phones have uh, has face, face unlock. So yeah, good, good proportion of the room. Um, in the uh, recent survey um, showed that 1.7 billion people worldwide have a smartphone. Now obviously not all of those have smartphones with biometric recognition on them, but that day is coming because uh, once Apple starts to move, that is the direction that the, uh, the industry tends to go. Um, and uh, I think it's a, r a fairly reasonable call that if I was standing up here in 10 years' time, many of you will not be carrying a wallet. Many of you will only be carrying a mobile phone, which you would use for payments and potentially all payments and potentially even things like a driver's licence and a passport. Centralisation of um, identity and transaction functionality um, and convergence has already started and it's only going to accelerate. So uh, in biometrics and banking, where's it being used and in financial transactions and how's it being used now? Well, um, there's quite a, a bit of uh, um, use of voice inside. Uh, so that's not um, speech recognition, as somebody was speaking, saying to me before, every time I order a cab, they send me to the wrong place. Well, this is not, this is not about recognising what you say. It's recognising who you are by your voice print. And uh, this has obviously got a lot of application to anywhere where you've got a call centre. 
and you can help tie identities back to an original enrolment record. Um, it's used to been used in Australia for uh, at least eight years now inside the welf uh, Australia's welfare agency Centrelink, um, and it's recently been um, adopted, or there are projects underway to use it with inside uh, ANZ in Australia and uh, inside Westpac. Um, so uh, there, there's a fair amount of history there, and actually building on what Aaron showed us before with those uh, fraudsters that have um, tried, been trying to impersonate other people. Well, there are two aspects to that. First of all, obviously, they're trying to impersonate somebody else, and they quite likely don't sound the same as that person. Um, but secondly, you'll notice that when one person conducts fraud, they're often not conducting one fraud. They're often ringing up and conducting fraud over and over again. Um, in driver's license authorities, if you have a look at the number of fraudulent driver's licenses, you'll often find individuals that have more than 10 fraudulent driver's licenses, and some I've seen instances of up to 40 fraudulent driver's licenses, all under the same person. So the ability of biometrics not just to be able to link one person to an earlier version, but also to be able to establish is that same person being enrolled more than once? Is, it, is this the same caller that I've had ringing up under a different identity yesterday? Or if I've got a watch list, is this person somebody that I should notify the call, uh, the call agents about? So um, there's a lot of activity happening in the voice area, and I think uh, it's, it's worthwhile um, keeping your eye on that space because I think there'll be increased adoption. I've just come from a conference in the UK, and again, there are a lot of UK banks which are moving in this direction as well. Um, Palm Vane, interestingly enough, uh, many of you may not have heard of this sort of technology, but uh, basically the vein pattern on your hand is unique to you, as is the vein pattern in your finger. And uh, using infrared sensors, they can pick out that, uh, that unique signature. Now, where's this being used? It's um, in Japan, many, many um, uh, banks use this technology as part of their ATM uh, process uh, as a replacement for a PIN. Um, and in um, South America, where there's been a, a really large problem with fraud, um, I'm led to believe, I haven't been there, but they have very high penetration of that uh, sort of technology into their ATM space as well. Um, I'm not going to talk very much about FACE other than to indicate that it's used significantly on driver's license authorities and passports and if you are trying to establish a link back to a government issued credential, so as part of what we would call in Australia a 100 point check, uh, the FACE is one of the best ways to do that because that history already exists. And so that, that goes back to what Mandy was saying with, with Real Me and how Real Me, Me is establishing that linked set of identities. Um, so uh, there are a range of different biometric technologies. They're used in a range of different placing, places within the financial um, sector. However, as I mentioned before, the really big news is the use in uh, mobile phones and uh, with Apple Pay and some other schemes which are coming, coming up. Um, the challenge with using uh, biometrics is really making sure that you've got a balance between uh, the security, the convenience, and the transaction speed. If any one of those things is, is not right, then you won't get people to adopt it. Um, and to be honest, to date, the, the, um, the focus has been very much on driving adoption, which is solving those issues to do with uh, convenience and transaction speed. And uh, Apple has done a fantastic job, whatever you might think of the Apple ecosystem, their fingerprint technology, really, they have uh, gone all out to make that both convenient and fast. Uh, I use an iPhone 6, and when you are using that, you really don't even think about the fact that there's a fingerprint sensor uh, as part of the uh, solution. Um, on an Android phone, and uh, face, face is not as secure for uh, transaction purposes, but to give you another example of this sort of convenience factor, um, the latest version of Android comes with a uh, face recognition system built in, and it will only ask you your PIN if it doesn't see your face. So if it sees your face and it can recognise you, then it will let you straight into it without you needing to do any authentication. And so it's, that's the kind of convenience angle. The question then becomes, so we're trying to make it more convenient, but how secure is it? 
How easy is it for somebody to break through a system like that? And what sorts of steps are we taking to prevent that? Um, the biometric enabled devices are everywhere and they just weren't a few years ago. Um, I was uh, in London recently with my sister who's a primary school teacher and it's got no technology no knowledge whatsoever, but she was having a relatively um, detailed conversation with me about biometric enrollment, like that would never have happened six months ago, but now she has an iPhone that's got a fingerprint sensor on it. Consumers are starting to be aware of the possibilities of biometric technologies and also some of the failures. So let's have a look at the two, the two schemes. We've heard quite a bit about Apple Pay this morning. Um, but what we didn't hear about was the biometric elements of Apple Pay. And the biometric elements are really important and quite innovative. Um, when Apple Pay went live, as per the um, Apple press release at least, more than one million cards were activated during the first 72 hours. Um, I don't know what the current stats are, but obviously uh, Apple has very high penetration. They've got lots of units in the marketplace. And if anybody already uses their fingerprint sensor as part of their logon procedure, which I think most Apple users probably do, then the step to using Apple Pay is, is a logical and easy next step. The, the technology uh, inside, this, um, inside the fingerprint sensor is what's called capacitive. It uses, uh, they bought a company called Authentic um, and they modif heavily modified their technology. Uh, the important, one important aspect for this discussion is um, that there's no uh, parent presenta presentation attack detection. Now, that's uh, short for spoofing. That means if I'm trying to make a fake fingerprint, how hard is it for me to make that fake fingerprint and bypass the, the, the detection mechanisms? Within 24 hours of the initial iPhone's release, um, a hacker group in Germany had already posted a uh, full video showing the process that they went through to break the iPhone sensor. And in fact, I will show you some stills from that in a moment um, and discuss the implications. Interestingly though, Apple has done a lot of things right in their design. One of the things that they've done very right, in my opinion, is that they've thought a lot about the security and privacy aspects. When you enroll your fingerprint into the, biomet into the iPhone, it doesn't store that in a place that can be accessed, at least as far as we know, the NSA doesn't have any access to it. Um, but basically, it, there's a digital, digital chip in there which has inbuilt encryption. The information goes into that chip. It can be verified in that chip. But if a hacker took over your phone or did some other thing to the phone, they would never be able to extract the information on your biometric template that's held inside the, the phone. So it's about giving the security that of um, trust associated with the fact that when I give my fingerprint to the system, it is not going back to Apple, it's not going back to a bank, it's staying right here on a device that I trust. And if I lose my device, nobody else can get access to that particular bit of information. The other uh, big player is a group called the FIDO Alliance. Um, I don't know any, if any of you have heard of that in this room, but um, it's actually supported by Google, PayPal, and Alipay, and it is a direct competitor to Apple Pay. Um, and the mechanisms for using it are, are quite similar, although the outcomes obviously are quite different and much more open. The whole point behind the FIDO Alliance is really to create a trusted payment system which can be used on a range of different devices to um, establish that sort of trust linkage. And again, if you want some uh, more in-depth detail, the FIDO website, um, just type in FIDO, uh, I think probably come up pretty close to the top of a, a Google search. And um, that does a pretty good job of describing it. But basically, uh, they want to put this onto every device, including iPhones, for secure payment transactions. The process is, relative, is obviously not quite as streamlined as a Apple uh, Pay because this, the system itself is not as neatly integrated. But the, the process is essentially you go to a, co uh, a website, you register with the website, the user gives approval for that website to access their, um, well, their financial or allow their financial uh, transactions to happen from that mobile. 
digital um, certificates are created and a key is, is associated with a particular biometric with a fingerprint or a face and when that um, process is finished that digital key is all that is transmitted off the device so again the provider or the website which is using this information has cryptographic assurance that a biometric match took place but does not is not the holder of the biometric information so they don't have a fingerprint or a face or a voice or something else that they need to worry about from the perspective of, of loss or, or privacy. Um, <clears throat> and the, 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 gen the whole concept behind this is to provide a completely open platform which can use a variety of different devices and tokens. So whether that's fingerprints, voice, iris or even um, various hard tokens. Um, so that's, they're, the, they're the two players and I will talk a little bit more about what I think is the future for those different systems at the end of the talk. Um, but before I do that I wanted to just discuss this issue of mobile or biometric vulnerabilities more generally, um, particularly on uh, the, the fingerprint side of things. So many of you will have heard or uh, seen um, articles about people breaking the fingerprint sensors. I don't know how many of you have actually looked at what's involved in that, but I'm going to take you through the steps now um, and then talk about some of the implications for that. Um, a brief history, um, there was a, a show called Mythbusters, many of you might know it. Many years ago they showed uh, on one of their programs breaking a number of fingerprint sensors by creating a, a transparency from a set of um, fingerprints taken off a glass and then creating a mold and then creating a fake fingerprint as a result. Some of, uh, some of the work that we've done has basically shown that um, you can now create very passable fingerprints that are pretty much transparent. You can see that uh, fingerprint down the bottom uh, there is basically a, um, a very thin uh, artifact which would be very difficult for a person to even notice in if they were they were looking at the system. The general process for creating an attack uh, for a fingerprint is to acquire the image and obviously we do leave our fingerprints around on a whole variety of surfaces not le least of which the, is the the cover for instance of an iPhone itself. To process that in some way uh, digitally image enhance it produce a, a mold um, and then create some sort of artifact from that. So what does that look like in practice? Um, basically the, the uh, people, the CT magazine that, that featured this story and you can go online and see the video for this, took a fingerprint off the display of the, of the iPhone. Importantly for this discussion however, this is all staged in the sense that they spent a long time, well they, they spent time actually making sure that they could get a decent fingerprint off the cover of the iPhone. So it's not like they just picked up an iPhone off the street and did this. They then process the image uh, to enhance the, enhance the structure. They print it onto a transparency. They then create a circuit board from that transparency. They need some um, a basically copper board that they're able to etch using UV light. Then they uh, apply, then they, well, in this case, they um, then, once they have this mold, they then put some wood glue into the mold. And then when you peel that mold off, you can see, sort of see it, it's in inverse there, you actually have a copy of the person's fingerprint. So, what did we learn from that? Um, basically, when you try and do this in practice, and I um, have done this many times myself, the, the, tra the difficulty is trying to locate and find a, us a usable high quality print. So you need to get enough information from a glass or from another surface to be able to actually create the, the fake print in the first place and that is not as easy as it sounds, certainly not as easy as it looks on CSI. Um, the, uh, you need some expertise in knowing what you need to be able to process and how you need to be able to enhance that image. You need specialised hardware associated with the etching process and you need some appropriate materials expertise because whilst the uh, video makes it look quite easy, it's actually quite easy to um, 
muck it up in terms of the way that you handle the material, both taking the mould out and applying it. If you're really good at this process, it takes you about two hours probably to actually acquire and then produce another um, a fake print. Um, so what is given given that scenario and given that you can break a, a phone that way, a iPhone that way, what does that mean for a security risk profile overall? Now we'll break this into two different types of attack. There's a non-directed attack. That is, um, I've left my iPhone on the table. Somebody picks up that iPhone. They've got no idea who I am, and they want to break into my iPhone. Um, so it's a casual or a lost iPhone type situation, casual, stolen, or, or, or just a lost phone. Now, in order to be able to do that, I need to have access to all the materials, I need to have the expertise, and I need um, a reasonable amount of time in order to be able to affect that. Um, some industry research said that the average time it takes for you to notice how long, if you have lost your mobile phone, is 40 minutes. So. Um, most of us would know if we don't have our phone on us, um, certainly within a relatively short space of time. And uh, all of these systems these days allow you to remote lock, lock and remote erase your mobile phone as soon as you've found it. So you've got a, a relatively lim limited window of time in which you need to break the, um, break the system. The other thing is that Ap Apple has quite cleverly made it so that if the iPhone is powered off or a number of other different security um, aspects are uh, violated, like for instance you have more than five tries, you need to use your PIN as well. So it doesn't solely rely on the fingerprint to provide that layered security. The more worrying attack of course is what if it's directed? What if somebody has actively gone out to seek your iPhone, uh, has spent the time to prepare all of the materials in advance, um, manages to turn off the connectivity so that um, you can't erase your iPhone once it's gone missing. Um, and so what sort of protections have you got under those circumstances? Well firstly, um, artifacts degrade. When you make this uh, fingerprint out of wood balm or whatever you, artifacts you use, that material actually degrades every time you use it. It's very, very seldom perfect to start with because you've created it off a latent print. So it actually takes a number of tries usually to get it operational. And um, in Apple's case, they give you five tries, I think. In some cases, they will only give you three tries. And actually getting a successful attack within a very short number of tries is, is, is hard. It's really hard, especially in an environment where you are covertly acquiring those fingerprints. Um, the, the attacker, even if they manage to compromise the phone, can't extract any of the template information. And um, if you baseline that against the difficulty of, protect, of a directed attack against a PIN or a, or a password, I would say that the fingerprints are still probably more secure in the sense that if I'm actively surveilling you to try and figure out what your PIN or password is that you enter on your mobile phone, there's a whole range of very high-tech surveillance equipment which is tiny, um, could even be sitting on your, your uh, tables right now and you wouldn't know it that can actually acquire that information. So um, yeah, don't think that pins and passwords are particularly secure at all, especially not against a directed attack. If you, however, um, do, uh, so a after you've done some sort of risk reduction, you've basically got, uh, I would estimate, a risk of medium to low associated with any casual attack, possibly even just low. A directed attack, if for instance somebody is really targeting your iPhone, they've got the expertise, then certainly it's quite possible to break through, um, break through these sorts of uh, fingerprint systems. Um, and we've just covered one type of attack. There are a whole range of other different types of attack mechanisms which are also relevant. If you implemented, let's say you implemented a banking application and your banking application required somebody to have provided some sort of login first and then required what we call a step up transaction. So they needed a fingerprint to, for instance, make a particular payment, but they needed to be logged onto your application first. Well, that really reduces your risk profile significantly because then the attacker not only needs to have acquired all your fingerprint information, but they also need to have all of the relevant banking passwords and things that, that would allow them onto the site. 
Um, so the sorts of things that can be done to uh, help mitigate these sorts of risks are providing increased settings control. Um, Apple still has their settings very locked down, so you don't really have a lot of configuration, but should, for instance, in an enterprise environment, certainly be possible to dial up the thresholds to make it more secure um, against the, the chance that people would get a few false rejects. Um, providing uh, various mechanisms for step-up authentication, um, and then basically using a number of other back-end analysis components to pick up if fraudulent activity is occurring. Finally, um, there are actually hardware. So the, the sorts of techniques that we've just shown you for creating a fake fingerprint can be detected using different types of hardware. At the moment, though, that hardware is uh, too expensive or not developed enough to be incorporated into a mobile phone, but it will happen over time. So just to be aware that, there, that uh, these sorts of technology innovations are always improving and there's always a race between people that are trying to break these systems and the people that are trying to make them. Um, with all of the activity, especially having just come back from this conference in London um, and uh, hearing from the mobile payments industry over there, um, I, I think 2015 is going to be a really big year for mobile biometrics and payments. Um, the Apple is going to continue to drive its uh, um, payment platform forward. The FIDO Alliance will be driving their payment forward. People will really start to see significant volumes of transactions which are done using biometrics, and that will be a first. That's never, never happened before. Um, as a consequence of that, there will be much more attention focused on the risk and vulnerability aspects. And um, that's something which I think has been uh, not highlighted enough in the past, and I hope this presentation gives you a flavour for the sorts of things that um, people that are using biometrics or customers for biometrics need to be aware of. Um, I think in the, into the future, however, there is going to be um, harmonisation of these standards. I think if you look far enough ahead, Apple Pay and Fido will realise that they're um, better to be cooperating on these things than to be sit as separate ecosystems. Um, certainly within a sort of a five-year horizon, I think we'll start to see that consolidation. Um, and finally, um, I'd send an uh, a, uh, invite to anybody who's in this sector to um, find out some more about the Biometrics Institute and see how we can help you with, uh, with your journeys into the, the world of biometrics, because uh, if, uh, if you're not using it already, you, you will be. Thanks. Thank you, Ted. That is all a little bit CSI. Very interesting stuff. Does anyone have, we've got maybe a minute or two for a question if anyone has a burning question? None. Yes, one in the middle. Hi. Um, you've mentioned various methods of biometric uh, authentication techniques from fingerprinting to face recognition and voice. Um, uh, each of them have different levels of invasiveness to each, everybody. Is there a threshold, do you think, that society has um, to which uh, they may um, choose to adopt a certain type of biometric scanning? Look, I, I think that that question um, would have been more pertinent a couple of years ago, but I think people very, as we see with um, Facebook um, and other social media sites, people share a lot of information about themselves when, they, when it's convenient for them to do so. When it, when the convenience trumps other things, and really, ultimately, where people have got a, thing, a biometric, which makes things more convenient, which makes transactions more quick, uh, happen more quickly and more uh, securely, I really think that in most cases, people will not have very much of a threshold to use to using biometrics, and particularly when you've got some of many of the big consumer um, organisations pushing this sort of uh, technology. So, but the important thing to know is that it's being used safely and that the information is being handled correctly. And so it's issues to do with trust and security are, are paramount, and that's some of the things that the Institute is really trying to drive forward um, from an industry perspective. Good question. Anyone else? Or are you just having a stretch? 
<laughs> okay, that um, is great. Thank you very much, Ted. And um, thank you to all of our panellists in this afternoon session, Ted and earlier Aaron and Mandy. We're going to break for afternoon tea now, which is brought to you by Semble, the guys who I think who are making all the noise next door um, during Ted's session. And we're going to meet back in the communal room at 3.45.